Very quick run through uh, uh, what I've called a short progress report, partly to give some sense of where we have been uh, over the last few years on the big agenda, on the helicopter view, um, and some thoughts about risks and potential opportunities as well at a macro, uh, macro level. And that's uh, in part the reason I'm badged as a senior advisor for engaged tracking is precisely because engaged tracking looks at low carbon quoted businesses on global stock markets and therefore is in a position to uh, assess uh, the situation when it comes to uh, progress. Uh, temperatures are continuing to increase. Um, you'll all be aware of that pretty standard graphic for uh, global warming. Um, perhaps what people are less aware of is that the uh, continued increase in temperatures and no sign, by the way, of the famous pause uh, that was much um, trump trumpeted by climate skeptics. Uh, but you are clearly getting, and the insurance industry will testify, uh, a related increase in climate-related uh, uh, accidents and disasters. The blue bars show the climate-related uh, disasters in just straight numbers, and the economic damage is the red line. Um, as you can see, it's very variable, but there's not much doubt about what's happening to the trend, which is why the insurance industry continues to be one of the big mainstream industries which is most aware of this issue and goes on uh, telling us about the need for rapid political and policy change. Climate regulation is increasing globally. Uh, if you look at what's happening both developing countries and developed countries, uh, you can see that there's been a steady increase uh, in the amount of uh, regulation aiming at the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon pricing is now covering a quarter of global emissions, and again, with a very steady increase in the trend. And 165 countries have now submitted national plans under the Paris COP uh, climate change agreement. So uh, if you think that there are 200 countries worldwide, uh, the vast bulk of uh, emissions is now covered by plans which don't add up, it has to be said, uh, to a uh, reduction in emissions which stabilizes at two degrees, but absolutely crucially uh, allows through the Paris Agreement a ratchet whereby uh, those agreements are constantly changed. So that's uh, broadly what's happening on very quickly skimming through on the policy front. One of the things which uh, I, those of you who heard me give a similar report last year may remember I went into rather more detail on what's been happening on the technological front. The uh, reduction in costs on solar, on wind, on onshore wind, on offshore wind, and on battery continue uh, quite substantially. This shows solar. Um, and you can see that this is the module price for solar, which doesn't equate, of course, to the installed price, since the installation cost is more labor intensive, and that's not coming down uh, similarly in price. But you are getting a very substantial continued reduction. And this is broadly the same technology. This is basically reductions in price coming about through manufacturing scale rather than through uh, any of the very substantial and exciting uh, potential technological changes that there are in the pipeline to get PV uh, much more effective. And what that essentially means is that you now have three renewable technologies which, depending on what part of the world you're looking at, uh, are already cheaper than any uh, alternative in terms of megawatt hour, uh, cost per megawatt hour. 
Solar, obviously, in sunny climes. Unfortunately, the uh, yield on a solar panel in the UK is about half of what it is in southern Spain or Arizona. Uh, but wind and offshore wind are now coming in lower than the cost of the cheapest uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, new plant, which would be uh, gas. Uh, Trump is certainly slowing progress, but he's not stalling it. A rather cramped uh, map of the US here uh, on the left of the slide, uh, which shows you the states that have signed up to uh, the basic targets within uh, the Paris Agreement and the blue blobs of the cities that have signed up. So this is the state and city coalition for action in the US, but I would stress more fundamentally U.S. emissions are continuing to fall, and indeed they fell last year to a 25-year low, and it's not so much because of this political coalition uh, trying to keep U.S. efforts going despite what's happening uh, in the White House. It's because gas uh, is replacing coal on the U.S. electricity grid, and increasingly solar and other renewables are replacing gas uh, where uh, there are the right conditions, whether it's sunny, the sunny south or the windy uh, Midwest. Uh, so you've, you're getting a continued fall uh, there in U.S. emissions, which I don't think Trump is going to uh, be able to stop whatever he does to the EPA and whatever he tries to do in reversing the clean coal uh, plan, simply because that's what the economics is now dictating. Half of the G20 countries now have stable or falling emissions. It's not just the US, it's not just uh, Europe. The International Energy Agency now finds that renewables are the fastest growing energy source globally. In the US, for example, it's now up to 18% uh, last year, and that's a proportion that's doubled in just 10 years. Uh, and I mentioned uh, through solar, the, there's also been an enormous and very surprising uh, fall in offshore wind costs. Um, I think I was astonished. I think a lot of people in the industry were astonished at the fall of offshore wind costs to £57 a megawatt hour in the auctions that were held uh, for uh, offshore uh, contracts for difference in the UK. And that means uh, in the UK that offshore wind is cheaper without measuring in backup costs, it's cheaper than, uh, for example, building new gas. And global clean energy investment last year came in at 333 billion uh, US dollars, despite falling costs. So there's a very substantial increase in volume. The actual uh, cost is now coming down uh, substantially. And markets are still, this is a good news for those who are looking ultimately to uh, IPOs and to, to a flotation, markets are still valuing low-carbon companies more highly and increasingly so. So last year I went into four separate studies which have shown that there is no trade-off between being virtuous as an investor and actually having to take a haircut uh, in terms of your investment. In fact, the evidence is very clear that if you're investing in low carbon, you're getting a higher, uh, at least on equities that are uh, uh, quoted on, world gl on global markets, you're getting a higher return than you would if you're straightforwardly invested across the market according to market capitalization. And uh, I think there are three fundamental reasons uh, for that. One is uh, that if a management team in a quoted equity, in a quoted company, uh, is good at looking around the corner at the next problem, if they've spotted climate change, uh, then when we pick up their low carbon efforts uh, through uh, the measurements uh, that we're using at ET, uh, then you're probably also picking up that as a proxy for good, effective, far-sighted management. They may be far-sighted on other things as well. Secondly, there's undoubtedly a demand side shift. More and more investors, more and more Charities, universities, millennial, high net worth individuals want to invest in low carbon. And perhaps the third and most important reason, given that investors are incredibly risk averse and don't like losing money, 
is that there is uh, a lot of evidence that if you're going for low carbon investment, you're removing yourself from the line of fire when it comes to disruptive technologies. And you can look and see at those who've been in the market as a whole, and they were the people who were losing out of, uh, for example, the failure of Peabody Coal and other coal companies in the US, the uh, reduction in the share price of some of the big utilities, which were very heavily uh, reliant on carbon and so forth. And there's much more of that potentially still to come. So there are very good economic reasons why you would expect low carbon to outperform. But the reality is, as I quoted last year, four separate studies and our research continues to show that that is uh, the case. So let me just conclude with a few uh, key uh, resuming a few key points. First of all, it's absolutely crucial. Three renewables now, solar, onshore wind and offshore wind are now cheaper in increasing parts of the globe than any other new electricity generation, full stop. And the rollout of renewables, uh, I haven't shown you this on the slide, but the rollout of renewables today is now exceeding the most optimistic forecasts of five or 10 years ago. In fact, it's even exceeding the forecasts which were derided at the time from Greenpeace uh, as saying that there was going to be a major rollout for renewables, the reality has been even better. The low emission revolution, precisely because this rollout is happening through the basic economics rather than now through subsidy, uh, is unstoppable. And the only issue is the speed of the rollout, and that is going to be determined by the policy change, by carbon price, carbon taxation, uh, and the success of the policy framework. There is a danger, clearly, and I showed you the global temperatures uh, chart, that we're going to have faster climate impacts than expected. You've heard a lot over the last few weeks of concerns about, for example, the speed of the glacier melt in Greenland, Iceland, and indeed of the winter ice in the Arctic. The importance of glacier melt as opposed to sea ice is that it actually raises sea levels and there are uh, considerable worries amongst meteorologists that we are seeing a more rapid change uh, there. That's important because that could accelerate the politics and indeed market perception of this area. There are continued challenges, been some very interesting ideas today to tackle uh, some of them, but the deep decarbonization, particularly for the Northern Hemisphere, is still a challenge because of the very sharp heat demand peaks, far greater than the winter demand peaks for electricity. Uh, and finally, a thought, I don't think there have been any uh, particular uh, proposals today in this area, but one maybe for the future, I fear uh, that although we are going very solidly in the right direction, uh, the speed of change is the big issue and is going to be the big issue that policymakers have to face in the near future. And we may well find that we have to put geoengineering solutions onto the agenda to buy time for the deep decarbonization, which we now increasingly know we can do. We've got the technological solutions and we're rolling them out and we're getting the cost down uh, and there are enormous benefits uh, from doing that. So my uh, conclusion is one that's, pest, that, that, that's cautiously optimistic. Uh, the direction of change is right. The technology is happening. The costs are coming down. The worry has got to be about the speed of change globally. Uh, and whether we're going to be able to meet the sort of agenda that we need to if we're going to keep global warming to within two degrees centigrade of pre-industrial levels. Thank you very much.